Hi, <laughs> Mahim, everybody. I made a bracha while I was on mute. Now we are alive and talking. <laughs> God heard it. I heard it. You heard it. <laughs> But the rest of the world didn't hear it. <laughs> the rest of the world didn't hear it. Yeah. Oh. So Miriam went to the post office with some Hanukkah cards. Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. And uh, so she's looking for uh, some Hanukkah stamps, <laughs> for her Hanukkah cards that she's sending out. So the guy at the post office asked her, of what denomination do you want? She says, oi vey, even for Hanukkah cards you have denominations? Okay, so I'll take, I'll take six Orthodox, 12 conservative, and 30 uh, reform. <laughs> So, Freilich and Hanukkah to everybody. If you didn't light your candles yet or your menorah of oil, even better, the preferred way to do the mitzvah, make sure in your home, every home needs to be lit up. Um, and with kids, even more so, right? Um, that uh, at least one menorah should be lit, if not more, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure we're all familiar with the story of Hanukkah. In brief, as we all know, famous story. They tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. <laughs> okay, so we'll say l'chai. <laughs> l'chai. If you have a latke to eat, please eat it. If you have a sufganiyot, a donut, mm. please eat it. Enjoy. Mm. So the basic story is in the mm. second century before the Common Era, the Syrian Greeks, the Greek nation then was divided into three different uh, divisions, and Eretz Yisrael, we had the Holy Temple, but we weren't completely in control of our own destiny because the Syrian Greeks were the rulers. Kind of let us do it, to some degree what we wanted. We had some kind of autonomy. Uh, but at some point, um, you know, there started a battle, as we will see. And they greatly outnumbered us. We won the battle. And as we know, all of the oil was contaminated. They found one jug of pure olive oil with the stamp of the high priest, enough to light for a day. Miraculously, it lasted for eight days until they could go up to the Galil, crush new olives, come back, take eight days, the whole journey. And a miracle happened. And therefore, we celebrate the holiday as we do now, right? Burning the oil for eight days. So we have two miracles that occurred, a military miracle, greatly outnumbered, not just outnumbered, but you know, all the modern day weaponry the Syrian Greeks had, we didn't have too much, right? If we look at the Talmud, There. All right. Let's see if we can do even a better job. Hold on. Oops. Mm. 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 
ça. Ok, perfect. Ok. And share. And order to share even better. I think it's this one. It's this one. No. Questions if it's going to be the same one. That's the one. That's the one up here, too. We're good up here. Amazing. Okay. Text number one from the Talmud. My Hanukkah. What is Hanukkah? The Talmud asks, and it responds, on the 25th day of Kislev, the days of Hanukkah are eight. One may not eulogize on them, and one may not fast on them. What is the reason? The Greeks entered the temple. They defiled all the oils that were in the temple by touching them. And when the Hashmanoi monarchy overcame them and emerged victorious over them, they searched and found only one cruise of oil, the seal of the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, undisturbed by the Greeks. There was only enough oil to light the menorah for one day. A miracle occurred, and they lit it, the menorah from it for eight days. The next year, the sages instituted these days to be made as holidays, to a recitation of Hallel and special thanksgiving and prayers and blessings. Anything missing from here in the story? That's a complete story, right? What's missing? Anybody? Maccabees. Sorry? Bill, speak up. The Maccabees. Right, the Chashmanoim are mentioned, that's true, but yeah. the Maccabees, what, what do you mean by the Maccabees, Bill? They didn't talk about reclaiming the temple? Oh. Or, oh. Um, well, it does say they, they overcame must, and emerged yeah, yeah, okay, victorious overcame, over them. Right, right. That yeah. it does say. Yeah. But it doesn't speak about the battle per se. It doesn't speak about the military victory. It mentions it by the by, only to come to the miracle of the oil. It doesn't mention the military victory as a miracle, which indeed it was. Rashi says the following. On the words, my Hanukkah, what is the question? What is Hanukkah means? What miracle was it instituted to commemorate? In other words, Rashi is saying like this. When the Gemara, the Talmud is asking, what is Hanukkah? It's not asking, what's the story? What's the history of Hanukkah? That's not its question. Its question is, why are we commemorating this holiday? That's its question, the Talmud. What was the catalyst that led the sages in the day that, as, as the Talmud says, in the following year that they came together and they made or brought the, the Jewish people to commemorate the miracle of the oil, right? So in other words, we celebrate Hanukkah because of the miracle of the oil, not because of the military victory. And of course, the question is obvious.
right? What's the obvious question? Anybody? Flesh out the question. Yes, correct. Absolutely. Right. Makes sense. Okay, so that's the question. Well, that's what we're asking, right? Yeah. But let's flesh out the. If there wasn't a victory, what would happen? Where would the Jews be today? Right? Where would they be? I mean, it would, there was survival of the Jews. You know, if you would compare it to the Six Day War or Yom Kippur War, imagine that, you know, you won the, vec you won the battle and the, what are you commemorating? Well, you know, we opened up a Chabad house now in Gaza. Or we opened up a Chabad house in Syria because, you know, we won the Golan Heights. So, we, you know, <laughs> or in, which is, made, you know, well, a wonderful we, thing. But if we had, you know, we had survival food, is kind of an important thing, right? So why would it have a secondary importance so much so that when the Gemara is speaking about the Talmud, is speaking about it and makes mention of it in passing only. It says we had a victory, but it doesn't emphasize the greatness of the victory. That's our question. And just to make the question a little more clear, the second Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Mittler Rebbe says, logically, it seems that the military victory of the many in the, into the hands of the few and the strong in the hands of the weak, Valanisim, was the primary victory and the, and the miracle of the oil secondary to it. But Hanukkah is observed on the 25th of Kislev when the miracle of the oil occurred and not on the 24th when the military victory took place. Why do we give primacy to the seemingly secondary miracle and relegate the seemingly primary miracle to a secondary status. Now, the miracle of the oil is no no doubt is a great miracle. We're not, we're not su suggesting that, right? But remember, the Jewish people were at a time of great assimilation. There was a war. It was a war for our survival. Beautiful, a flickering flame of a, of a menorah that should flicker and should be there is wonderful. But the courage and the self-sacrifice of the Maccabees and those who stood with the Maccabees seems to be a phenomenal um, feat that needs to be commemorated. But the Talmud doesn't seem to make that what the story is about. Chaim. Question's clear, yeah? Great. Okay. So let's go back now and understand everything that occurred and get a little more context. You know, I told the story over very shortly, right? They tried to defeat us. We won. Let's eat. Very simplistic, but let's get a little more meat on the bone over here <laughs> so we can appreciate the full story. How did it emerge, the battle? Why was there a battle to begin with? Because it did not begin with war. It began with an ideological war, not a physical war. It evolved into a physical war, but it began with an ideological war. Let me explain. You know, the Jewish people are known to be smart, right? We uh, we do well in business. <laughs> we do well in commerce. We do well in many areas, right? In science. In science, in literature, you name it. 
And most importantly, we do well in Torah, Torah teachings, right? But as important as our minds are, and to use our minds, you know, as fully as we're capable of, there's something that comes before the mind and greater than the mind, greater than human intelligence. And that is our spiritual intelligence, right? That's our soul. That is encompasses intelligence, encompasses in emotions. Today's chapter three in Tanya, what we learned today, right? But the essence of the soul is far greater than that. It transcends intelligence, our spiritual makeup, right? Our spiritual makeup is expresses itself in transcendence and faith. That faith then translates itself into sacrifice, right? To be able to sacrifice ourselves for that faith. Human intelligence would never sacrifice something unless it, you gain something from it meaning you know other faiths they are not sacrificing a darn thing because they know that if they're going to uh, die here they're going to get a better reward over there so that's not sacrifice it's like you know giving in an old jalopy that is run down in order to get um, you know rolls royce so you're going to get a rolls royce over there whether it's 72 Virginians, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, heaven instead of hell, going to hell, right? Because you believe and so on. So that's not sacrifice. That's not transcending intelligence. That's intelligent choice to make. I mean, it may be a corrupt, I intelligent idea, but it isn't. But the Jewish soul and the Jewish experience as great as, as the intelligence that Jew has, we have something greater than that, and that is transcending it. Our faith, which then will lead us to even sacrifice and to give up, um, to give up something. And we see that that's what the basis of Judaism. We know that there are uh, two basic laws in Judaism, laws that we understand and laws that we don't understand as Maimonides tells us text 4a the Torah states and you shall guard all my decrees chukim and all my judgments mishpatim and perform them our sages commented this adjures us to guard and perform both the chukim and the mishpatim the meaning of performing is well known that one should observe the chukim Guarding means to treat them with a caution and not think that they are any less than mishpatim, the uh, laws that are right beyond rationale. The mishpatim are those mitzvahs whose motivated rationale is openly revealed, and the benefit of their observance in this world is known, like the prohibitions against robbery and bloodshed, and the commandments to honor one's parents. The chukim our mitzvahs, whose motivation, motivating rationales are not known. As our sages said, I ordain decrees, chukim, and you have no license to question them. So, you know, when it comes to these things that are beyond logic, since the human condition, uh, you know, which we are all somewhat bound to, what propels us to do something when you appreciate it with your mind and you feel it in your heart? Right? So when we're told to do something that's beyond that, we have an inner struggle. It's not so easy to do that, right? To rise above it because you don't understand it, you don't appreciate it, and you don't feel for it. And yet God says, do it, right? There are such mitzvahs. Likewise, sometimes, you know, the nations of the world, they actually ridicule Jews for that that we will do things that are not reasonable, sensible, functionally good for society, and you just do it, because that's what God wants. That's irrational. Rambam continues. 
A person's natural inclination confronts him concerning the chukim. And the nations of the world challenge them as well. For example, the prohibition of the meat of a pig, milk and meat, the calf whose neck is broken, the red heifer, the goat sent to Azazel on Yom Kippur. To what degree did King David suffer because of the heretics and the idolaters who would issue challenges concerning the, the decrees? As long as they would pursue him with false retorts, that they would arrange according to the humanity's limited knowledge, he would increase his clinging to Torah, as the verse says, willful transgressors have it stacked falsehoods against me, but I guard your precepts with a full heart. Hmm. In other words, those that mock something that transcends logic, faith, Right, mock the Jew as King David or any Jew that gives themselves over to something that is not functionally valuable for, for yourself, for society, and you're just doing it because you know some crazy tradition that you have from 3300 years ago. That's why you're doing it, because that's what the what God tells you to do, and therefore that's what you listen. Do what's good for you. Do what's reasonable. Do what's rational. So that's the background of the type of commitment that a Jew needs to have that is super rational. And even when it comes to the mitzvahs that are rational, ultimately our commitment to them are super irrational, even not to murder. We don't murder because it makes sense to us, and because you know we, full uh, and and a full heart are abhorred by murder. Today you might have a full heart, tomorrow you might not. <laughs> All right. Today you may understand it one way, and tomorrow not. So our commitment to it, even to something as rational as not to murder. By the way, murder means murder, but cold-blooded, as opposed to um, killing. killing, exactly, and self-defense. So, today we may feel that way and be committed that way, but to tomorrow, who knows? So ultimately, we are, even to those mitzvahs, we're committed to because God said so. And this is what the war of the Greeks was all about. The Greeks were different than almost all of those that hated Jews throughout the last 3,300 years. Most of the, you know, besides the Greeks and besides Stalin in Russia, he didn't want to eradicate the Jew. He wanted to eradicate God from the Jew. And that's exactly what the Greeks wanted to do. They wanted to annihilate God from the Jewish people. They didn't want to eradicate the Jew. Not like Haman, not like Hitler, not like the Crusades, not like the Inquisition and so on and so forth. In other words, the Greeks tolerated Jews and their lifestyle, but this idea of chokim, something that is beyond logic, beyond rationale, beyond the human dimension, no, that was a problem. So give charity, fine. Honor your parents, absolutely. But rituals that have no functional value for them, there's a functional value to honor your parents, right? There's a functional value in being charitable. Those things are reasonable. Those things are logical, right? But the God said, and therefore you're going to abide, that's a problem. As the previous Rebbe says, the Greeks' war was a spiritual one. They did not wish to physically harm the Jews. Rather, their primary objective was to make them forget that the Torah is God's Torah, and the mitzvahs are his will, meaning they did not have a problem with God insofar as an intellectual exercise, to be sure. Greeks were a highly sophisticated people and recognized the brilliance of the Torah. 
However, they opposed the notion that it was God's Torah, a holy Torah. Against this, they battled. Right? As a matter of fact, King Ptolemy had 70 sages translate the Torah into Greek because he appreciated the great relevance, meaning, and value in the Torah. It's got great wisdom. It's a beautiful parable for life, right? But it's got nothing to do with God as far as they were concerned. And that was their war. So th was there a physical war where it began? No. The root cause of everything was our readiness to go and self-sacrifice for this belief. But that's not what they had a difficulty with, right? So in the beginning, they only outlawed certain mitzvahs. Brismillah. What are you mutilating a, a human body? Right? They were they were into the sciences, the arts, and into physical beauty. And you're violating the physical beauty of a of a, of a human body by circumcision. And for what purpose are you doing it? Because of covenant with God. Decree against that. A decree against Shabbos, because Shabbos is celebrating God as creator. You know, to, to take maybe a day of a family day, that's a cultural lifestyle that could be tolerated. But that it is a day that's dedicated to God as creator, that was a decree against Shabbos. So the plan was never to battle the Jew. Yes, they had their troops there checking and stamping out any sign of religion, just as the Soviets did with Judaism in the former Soviet uh, Union, right? They had their informers and they came and the KGB stamped out anything. If you, if you built a mikvah, if you had an underground yeshiva, so they uprooted it. They sent you to Siberia. I mean, sometimes they got killed because if they were too much of a risk, right? But that was not what, you know, that was not the battle. It was an ideological battle that evolved from there. As the Lubush says, the Jews at the time were not subjugated to a ruler who wanted to annihilate them like they were in the times of Haman. Rather, the Greeks, led by the ruler Antiochus, only wanted Jews subservience, so Jews subservience and devotion to their culture and faith system, just like any conquering nation subjugates those who uh, those they vanquish to their they vanquish to their beliefs and faith. If the Jews would have accepted the Greek sovereignty, adopted their beliefs, and agreed to pay their, them taxes, the Greeks would have not asked for more. Hmm. And this is further shown by the fact that when they came into the Holy Temple, they didn't destroy it. Right? They contaminated it. They contaminated the sanctuary. They contaminated all of the flasks of oil that they found that had the seal of the high priest that made that that was a certainty that they were pure. Pure what? Pure olive oil. Spiritually, Spiritually pure. It was pure olive oil because it was physically pure olive oil. Right? They didn't have a problem with, with olive oil because olive oil has a function. It creates light. It's used for food. It's no problem with it. So they didn't destroy it, but they opened up the flasks in order that it should contaminate the holiness of the oil. Right?
and they contaminate the menorah, they contaminate the um, the utensils, the implements of the holy temple. Because the menorah, why did they light a menorah? Because did it for illumination? No. For a mitzvah. It's non-functional. And what didn't serve as lighting, to serve as lighting, they appreciated that. But to serve as a function, just as a, or non-functional, but just for the sake of a mitzvah, because that's what God commands, that they contaminate. Right? So this then becomes the real battle. And this is what the Maccabees fight against. The physical battle was only because of a spiritual one. Right? Think about it in other terms. Right now, there's a battle in Israel. What's the battle for? Is it for the sake of the battle? No. It's to bring peace in the land of Israel. Destroy the enemy. The devil. Well, is it to destroy the animal? A the enemy? Devil. The devil. No, yes. the dev but it, that's not the point. The point is by doing that, you will now your family will be able to live peacefully and you'll be able to live as a Jew in peace, right? It, the devil's purpose is to destroy for the sake of destruction. Ours is not to destroy for the sake of destruction. Ours is to destroy for the sake of what the real goal is, the spiritual goal, right? That we can have a freedom to be and not to always look over our back and worry that we're going to, you know, that there'll be a destructive force trying to annihilate us, right? So how, why are they the devil? Because the devil, the, the Satan, right? The angel of death, his purpose is death, period, right? Our purpose is not death. We have to exact death and destroy and annihilate, not for the sake of destroying and annihilating, but for the sake of peace. Right? That's why. But that's not what evil is about. Evil is about for the sake of destroying. It's for the sake of destroying. Because the hatred is so great, right, that that leads you to the desire just to destroy for the sake of destroying. That's what Hamas is. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Exactly. Right. I'm saying, but that's not what the Jew is. No. And that's the story of Hanukkah. In other words, the battle was only to protect our spiritual wealth. Is that, is that clear? Good. And... It wasn't the battle so we could win <laughs> and that they would be defeated. And merely survive. No, what are we surviving for? So I can be a Jew and live a Jewish life. Do a mitzvah. Study Torah. Be a light unto the nations. Yes. Uh, Alan sent a really good message in the team chat. Ours is to have the freedom and peace to practice our Judaism. Yep, exactly. Amazing. Who said that? Someone's I Alan, Alan. Alan. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so this is the deeper meaning of what the, the menorah symbolizes, the miracle of the oil of what it embodies. As the the Greeks wanted to make the Jews forget about the divine aspect of Torah. They did not want to harm them physically. Therefore, they deliberately contaminated the oil of the temple, for the oil represents the divine light of the Torah. Consequently, the miracle of the oil, which was the answer to the Greeks' primary scheme, is the primary miracle of Hanukkah, the military victory, the answer to the physical conflict that the Greeks never intended, is secondary to it. Again, just to bring from today, 
we are not battling the evil of Hamas, so we should be merely victorious over them. So we annihilate evil. Yes, we're annihilating evil, but that's an order that we could live in peace as a Jew so we could fulfill what God's destiny is for us, to live as Jews in fulfillment of Torah and mitzvahs and to bring the light of Torah and mitzvahs into the world to bring the final redemption, right? That is, the, that's the goal, right? Therefore, the battle is only means to an end. And likewise with the Greeks, the battle is a means to a greater end, is that we could live a Jewish life. So you might say, well, but survival. Well, Jews are not survivors. We're thrivers. Thriving through Torah mitzvahs. That's what we're here for. We're not here to survive. Animals survive in the jungle. No animal thrives. They merely survive. That's all they're about. Right? So Hamas, who it would not be fair to the animal kingdom to call them that. <laughs> that would be a put down to the animal. And we don't want to do that. Wouldn't be right. Right. Um, thriving. <laughs> or th it's about surviving. And just being a bigger, you know, stronger lion that you could, uh, you know, knock down your enemy. Okay. So now we understand something. That the main miracle or the main thing that we need to celebrate and why we're celebrating is for the what the purpose ultimately is. You know, is not to survive, but to thrive as a Jew and to thrive as a Jew with Torah and mitzvahs. And therefore, that's what the miracle of the menorah re represents. That's the case. That's wonderful. But I mean, the miracle of the military victory is still something. It may not be the main thing, but isn't it something that we should also commemorate? At least make, you know, honorable mentions, right? Like you have, uh, you know, the Academy Awards, you have, you have the, you know, the best, you know, the leading actor, but then you have the supporting role. You also get an award for that, right? So why not get it as a supporting role? <laughs> Right, an Academy Award for a supporting role to the Maccabees for the victory over the Syrian Greeks. No, yeah, no, no one seems to like my joke. I guess because you're taking it seriously, <laughs> Alan. You like it, huh? Okay, at least you're at least you're laughing. Someone else over here. I don't know what's going on with these guys here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Alan, you might have to come here next week so you can, you know, get a, a light a little uh, smile under them. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer actually is pretty simple. We do. In the prayer, Alanisim, in the Siddur, you have the Tilas Hashem Siddur, and you'll look at the Shachris service, and you go to page 51. The bottom page 51 in the gray area, al Anisim that we say for Hanukkah for throughout the eight days by Shachar Ismin Chemari. So let's look at text number 10. Let's look at the end, All right? So we say there, you and your abundant mercy stood by them in their time of distress. You defended their cause. You judged their grievances. You avenged them. You delivered the mighty into the hands of the weak, the many into the hands of the few, the defiled people into the hands of the undefiled, the wicked into the hands of the righteous, and insolent sinners into the hands of the diligent stu students of your Torah. And you made for yourself a great and sanctified name in your world and your people Israel. You performed a great deliverance and redemption Unto this very day. Ah, look at that. We do mention it. 
right? In our prayers, three times a day, that God deliver us, the, the many into the hands of the few, the weak into the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the strong into the hands of the weak, right? What's interesting, are we mentioning the oil over here? No. Hmm. So what's going on? It looks like the two can't live together. When the Talmud speaks about it, it speaks about really the only the oil. In passing, it mentions military victory. When we say Alanisim, pretty powerful, uh, you know, statements that we're seeing over here. Even what we do mention about the lighting and the uh, a lighting, it's in plural because it's about just the whole. It's not even mentioning really about the miracle. It doesn't mean we don't mention the miracle at all in Alanisim. We mention about cleansing the courtyard and the sanctuary and and lighting up, but not the miracle. Why? Why wouldn't the two things, two thoughts, be brought together in our prayers? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? It's a similar. Similar. The exact same um, wording. Exact same wording. And even when we do mention, by the way, we do mention, but not the miracle of it. You know, then your children entered the shrine of your house. They cleansed your temple, purified your sanctuary, kindled lights in your holy courtyards. But that's not even courtyards. That's not even in the sanctuary, right? That's because back then... And, you know, everything was with uh, uh, olive oil light, right? And instituted these eight days of Hanukkah to give thanks and praise to your great name. No miracle mentioned. But the miracle of the military victory is yes mentioned. There's no one around. Who's going to light the candles? About, maybe the, the Gemara doesn't mention it. No, military. The Gemara doesn't mention the military mil, uh, victory. It only mentions the, mir, uh, the the instituting of the holidays because of the eight days of miracles of the lights of the but, menorah. But here we don't even mention it. So come on, what's going on? If we didn't have that military victory, there'd be no one to sit there and light the lights. Wait, wait, wait a second. Wait, wait a second. One second. One second. Wait, 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 wait. Back up for a second. Yeah. Didn't we just come away saying that the main um, the main thing was not the military victory? I know, but if it wasn't for the military victory, who yeah. would be around to light the lights? Yeah, yeah, but no. But why isn't the Alanisi mentioning the miracle of the of the lights? That's that's the question. That's Mention true. both. Mention both. We need the victory before. Was you need, you no, that's not an answer. answer. That's not an answer. You have to get rid of these guys so you could go and light the lights. Okay, so then, but 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 the Gemara mentions only the miracle, and in our prayers we only mention the military victory. which came first? The chicken, the chicken, the chicken. Chicken and the egg came first, by the way. They both came. Huh? Because they, obviously they're not mentioning each other, right? They're like, right? They're they're like. So is it because it was always mentioned here in our prayers that the Talmud decided let's talk about the other miracle, or is it the other way around? Is it possible that they felt that it was ignored there, and therefore they wanted to put it into the Talmud and make sure that they had a good and it was something spiritual? Well, what, one second. The Talmud is only expressing the fact. The fact is, my Hanukkah, why was, as Rashi explained, why was there a commemoration? So that was back then. It wasn't the Talmud, right? Why is there a commemoration of Hanukkah? Is not because of the military victory, is because of the 
miracle of the menorah, period, right? Then in our prayers, we don't mention it at all. All we mention is military victory. Which was written out first? So the, probably the holiday itself was, you know, I don't know. The Talmud came before the prayer. No, no, no. The Talmud is only expressing what happened. The Talmud was written in the year 500. And, and Hanukkah was 700 years before that, right. right? Talmud is only telling us why, in fact, we have the holiday to commemorate. That's all. It's just explaining it. It's not creating it. It didn't create it because it was been celebrated for 700 years before it was written in the Talmud. The Talmud right? The right? It's already been celebrated for 700 years in the before the Talmud wrote about it. Remember, till the Talmud wrote about it, it was all oral because the Torah was oral tradition except for the written word. And this is a rabbinic, a rabbinic holiday, not a biblical holiday. So for sure the whole thing is only orally transmitted. It was only written down in the Talmud 700 years after the occurrence of what happened. But they're just ascribing to why there is a holiday that we're commemorating. Okay? But okay, very simple. We see very simple that the two don't seem to come together for what, and, and that's what we need to understand. Okay? That's pretty obvious. Why is that? I'm so sorry, Rabbi. Doesn't the word uh, the word, the phrase, uh, the al hanisim, hanisim, isn't that plural? Isn't that say miracles? Yeah. Doesn't it like uh, refer to the multitude of miracles or true miracles per se? Yeah. So. Do you want to make the question even bigger? Yeah. Because <laughs> it's saying speaking plural miracles and only mentions the military miracle. Okay, thank you, thank you for making the question bigger. <laughs> <laughs> you were trying to answer something and uh, you, you put your, if that's the case, you put your foot in your mouth. <laughs> if you're trying to answer, you just made the questions bigger. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. No, good. It's okay. We'll, we'll answer. You know, yeah, you're okay. We're looking for an answer now. Okay. So, what did we mention before? That the Physical military victory is an evolution from the spiritual, right? Because really it was ideological, a spiritual battle about two different world views. Correct? Mm -hmm. Right? So when we reflect upon the spiritual victory and how important that is just think for a moment my nephew's in gaza right now i text him i'm on a he's in gaza right now i thought he was i thought he was going to be home for shabbos but it looks like he didn't get home for shabbos he's in gaza right now god should help the idea to eradicate all of Hamas today. Finish before Shabbos. Uh, you're, you're you're too you're too uh, you're too cruel. <laughs> no, you're too cruel today. Finish it today. God could God if he wants he could finish it today. Amen. Uh, I was saying, uh, right at no not before Shabbos because we, at once Shabbos comes Hanukkah is over, oh. right. And let my nephew and all of the rest of the wonderful, beautiful soldiers, all of them go home so they could celebrate Hanukkah with their family. My nephew could celebrate with his two children and wife and my sister, his mother, and so on, right? Wouldn't that be like, wow, amazing? that they could all go back because they finished the job. So what are they going to really celebrate? What's going to be the real, wow, I could be with my family, I can't get light a menorah with my, with my family. <gasps> That's heartfelt. That's beautiful. That's amazing. And it was all worth that battle in order that we can have this moment now that we could light the menorah and be a Jew, right? 
The same thing is, that's what happened then, right? That the main point of it is the spiritual battle that we can have now and that we win the spiritual battle that we could live our lives as a Jew, right? So the physical victory would pale in significance in compared to the feeling that now you have your spirit back. Now, right now, we're not, we're fighting physical existence against Hamas. It's not a, it's not a spiritual war. I mean, even though everything evolves from the spiritual and, and, and devolves into the physical, that's true. But it's, it's like Haman, right? Haman to destroy the Jewish people from, from, <laughs> from the river to the sea is to destroy the entire Jewish people like Haman, right? So in that respect, it's, it, there's a distinction here, right? So imagine Hanukkah, where the whole point was a spiritual battle to begin with, that devolves into a physical battle of survival, but the survival is in order that we can have the spiritual victory. So imagine, now I could be with my family, I could celebrate Shabbos then, be home for Shabbos, like you said, <laughs> right back then, be home for Shabbos? Oh, so what would happen? The, 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 the quest of the battle of the, of the spirit of the Jewish people that it should be maintained, that there will be no more decrees against the Jewish people in keeping Shabbos, keeping bris milah, keeping the laws are now no longer a, 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 a thorn on our side. That's the very real victory. And that, therefore, it would pale in significance when you have next to it the military victory. That was yesterday's victory. But now the victory is we can live life as a Jew. That's the real victory. So it pale in significance that, because that's only a means to an end in any case. This is an end in itself. Rebbe. Oh no, sorry, that's the uh, sorry. Yeah. So therefore we have to celebrate them independently. Otherwise, the spiritual would always outshine the physical, because that's who we are as a people. The Rebbe says, when compared to the great spiritual revelation of Hanukkah, which was expressed through the miracle of the oil, the physical victory becomes insignificant. Therefore, when we wish to commemorate and offer thanks for the physical victory, we cannot simultaneously mention the miracle of the oil, because it would outshine the physical victory to the extent that it would become negligible. Therefore, we commemorate the two miracles at two different times. We commemorate the miracle of the oil by lighting the Hanukkah candles, and we commemorate the military victory in the prayer of al, al where we don't even mention the miracle of the oil, because then if we do, it outshines it. And in the end, like you said, we have to thank God for the military victory. I mean, come on, if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be able then to have our Hanukkah lights, we wouldn't be able to have our Shabbos. So we have to thank, but it's insignificant in comparison to the spiritual victory. Right? Which that was the beginning of what the battle was all about. Of a clash of two civilizations, a clash of, of, uh, of two ideas of what life is all about. But yet, we got to thank God for that. So therefore, Allah needs him, we only mention that. And what's prayer about anyways? So prayer, one of the ideas of prayer is thanksgiving. You got to thank God. You got to recognize what God gives you in your life and, and thank him for it, right? And thank him. So therefore, where would the appropriate place be? In prayer, right? Furthermore, what is prayer about? 
is a battle. When you pray, if you pray properly, you're engaged in the battle because it's in your it's about your heart. It's in your heart of your heart. Prayer takes a real effort because in your heart you're battling, you know. The outer heart wants just to fulfill my own desires, right? The animal soul. The animal soul. The inner heart wants to connect to God. So in prayer, we are battling those two things, right? So that's the battle of, yeah, even though it's a spiritual battle, but you know that's reflected also in a physical battle. And therefore, um, as Azor says, time of prayer is a time of, of war. So that that time we thank for the victory in war. Does that make sense? Yep. So for Thanksgiving, that you need to recognize God in your life and thank Him. So we have the we have the Amida, we have to say in there, Alanisin, or in, in, in benching, we have to say Alanisin, we have to thank for the miracles, right? But that's not what Hanukkah is about. That's not who we are, a people that go to war. We're about light. We're about illuminating. We're about transforming darkness into light. So therefore. That's how we celebrate. So we take in the even so the that's the whole spirit of what of Hanukkah is all about, right? That we our faith, our way of life of, of, of Jewish living is now able to be practiced. And therefore, how do we experience that or how do we express it? Well, we do it in a physical way because everything in the, we do is an expression in the physical, but it's an expression of a deeper spiritual reality. What is the most spiritual, physical thing on earth? A flame. A flame produces warmth. A flame produces light. Right. Everything spiritual is compared to light because the spiritual realm is entirely removed from physicality. Thus, everything that exists in the spiritual realm is an analogous to light. As King Solomon said, yeah, mitzvah, the Torah, or the mitzvah is the lamp and the Torah is the light. Therefore, the focus on Hanukkah is what the Greeks tried to do. They tried to squash our light. Torah and mitzvahs. Therefore, how do we express it? By celebrating the light of the menorah. Right? How do we do it? With oil specifically. Because that captures the spirit of Jewish life. Captured by light. Again, the warmth that it emanates, the beautiful flame. So everything in the physical world is drawn by the force of gravity downwards. More physical, right? By the, the more physical it is, the quicker it has its downfall. But there's one thing that doesn't, and that's the flame. When you look at the flame, as the previous Rebbe said, you look at the flames, our custom is to sit by the the candles, except for every Shabbos, Friday, we sit by the candles for a half an hour and look at the candles. Because the candles tell a story. I tell a beautiful story. You can see the way they flicker, right? You can see the different colors. You see the black. You can see the, 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 uh, the wick, how it's burnt. And only because it's burnt, it holds the flame of the candle, right? All of this is to tell us a story. Tell us a story that we have a soul that's always flickering and wanting to connect to its source. Wants to connect to its source because it's bound up, as we learned in Tanya, 
yesterday that the second soul of a Jew is literally a part of God. It's literally a part of God, right? And therefore, as deep and dark as it may be inside in our lives, or as deep and dark as it might be on the outside as it was in the times of the Syrian Greeks, or in the times of Stalinist Russia, the flame of the Jew was alive and kicking. And today, the flame of the Jew is likewise, right? So the Rebbe brings this out, a beautiful idea. The Rebbe writes to prisoners, a, a, I mean, to, um, a, a Jewish people who were in prison, Jewish in prison in America. By the grace of God, the 15th Kislev, 5738, November 25th, 1977, Brooklyn, New York, to all Jewish detainees everywhere. God be with you. Greeting and blessing. In connection with the forthcoming days of Hanukkah, I extend to you, to each and all of you, a prayerful wishes for a bright and inspiring Hanukkah, coupled with the fulfillment of your heart's desire for good in every respect. Hanukkah brings a meaningful message of the encouragement in keeping with all the festivals and commemorative days in the Jewish calendar, which are meant to be observed, not just for the sake of the remembrance, but also for the practical lessons they provide for, in our daily life. On the practical teaching, uh, uh, one of the practical teachings of Hanukkah is as follows. The special mitzvah pertaining to Hanukkah is, of course, the kindling of the Hanukkah lights, which must be lit after sunset, unlike the Shabbos candles, which must be lit before sunset. And unlike also the lights of the menorah that are, were kindled in the Beis Amidash even earlier in the day. The meaningful message is that the emphasis on kindling the Hanukkah lights after sunset conveys is when a person finds themselves in a situation after sunset, when the light of day has given way to gloom and darkness, as was the case in those ancient days under the oppressive Greek rule, one must not despair, God forbid, but on the contrary, it is necessary to fortify oneself with complete trust in God, the essence of goodness, and take heart in the firm belief that darkness is only temporary. It's only temporary darkness, right? And it will soon be suspended by bright light, which will be soon, which will be seen and felt all the more strongly through the supremacy of light over darkness and by the intensity of the contrast. And this, and this is the meaning of the lighting of the Hanukkah lights, and in the manner that calls for lighting an additional candle each successive day of Hanukkah, to plainly see for oneself and to demonstrate to others passing by in the street that light dispels darkness, that even a little light dispels a great deal of darkness. How much more so a light that suddenly grows in intensity. And if physical light has such a quality and power, how much more so eternal spiritual light. What has been said above pertains to our Jewish people as a whole, as well as to each individual Jew, man or woman in particular. The conclusion that follows from it is that through our uh, our Jewish people, it's still though sorry, though our Jewish people are still in the state of exile uh, of Golos, and darkness covers the earth. A time when nations rage and peoples uh, speak vain things. There's no reason to get overly excited by it. We have only to strengthen our trust in God, the guardian of his people, Israel, who neither slumbers nor sleeps, and to be confident that he will protect his people wherever they be and will bless them with atzlacha, success in all things and in growing measure, and that he will hasten the coming of the righteous Mashiach to bring us the true and complete Geul of redemption, which is fast approaching. Similarly, in regard to each individual, those who find themselves in a state of personal goals, there is no cause for discouragement, despondency. No, you're in jail. Oh, don't be despondent. God forbid. On the contrary, one must find increasing strength to complete trust in complete trust in the creator and the master of the universe, that their personal deliverance from distress and, con and, and confinement is on its speedy way. Wow. All the more so, 
when this trust is expressing growing commitment to the fulfillment of God's will in a daily life and conduct in accordance with his Torah and mitzvahs, of which the mitzvah of kindling the Hanukkah lights is particularly significant and that it symbolizes the illumination of the soul, the lamp of God, which is the light of Torah and mitzvahs. For a mitzvah is a lamp and a Torah is light, illuminating it in an increasing measure from day to day to bring about the fulfillment of the prophecy, the people walking in darkness of Golas will see a great light, as Isaiah says, in light of the Geula, with blessing for Hatzach and good tidings, and all above the Rebbe's signature. Wow, what a beautiful, right? So this is who we are. We are people of light. Um, we are people who seek to illuminate light and nothing but light. And that's what we are all about when we study Torah like this, when we do mitzvahs of lighting the menorah. And if you adopt a hostage by doing a mitzvah, you'll do even more so. You'll even do more so, which, you know, we're on that campaign. So that's going to be coming out uh, globally. But while you still have a chance, <laughs> as they say in French, <laughs> so yes we have to thank for the military victory and yes we have to see the miracles that our God is doing for our Jewish people today even though 98 soldiers have lost their life that's 98 too many 98 too many since um, the war has begun that's not including what was on the first day that, you know, there were soldiers also then, but since fighting the war. And all the injured. And all, yes, and, you know, all the injured. So we uh, we pray for them. And um, it's um, something that we have to see the miracles. And there are great miracles that are happening. Unbelievable uh, for the Jewish people right now. There's no doubt about it. Yes, again, it's painful, even one loss but the miracles we do and therefore we have to be thanking god for all of those miracles but that's not what we are celebrating we're celebrating doing a mitzvah living jewish life right and therefore that's why we have to increase in torah mitzvahs because that's what it's all about and now that it's hanukkah if you know someone who doesn't have a hanukkah menorah if they're in montreal let me know We'll get them a menorah, or you be the messenger of God, of the Rebbe, Shliach, to bring them in a menorah, bring them candles, and you know that they can celebrate properly and increase the light. Thank you, folks. Any All questions? Right. Any comments? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, folks. God bless Thank you me. all. Always. Always. Any questions, comments? I always feel energized after this. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Th thank you, folks. God bless you. Thank you.